Kings, where there's a story in every bottle. Just like having a side conversation yeah, that would when be, we actually go This would be live. one of those times. Oh, yeah. One of these times. Maybe. Did that just happen? It could be. We caught off guard. Did that just happen? You did that. You were poking uh, I didn't me. Do that. No way I would do that. <laughs> Why would I do that? Cheers, everybody. Hey, cheers, you guys. <laughs> cheers, dude. All right. Another Monday Live. Oh, yeah. There we go. <laughs> we did it. <laughs> it's, uh, yes, it is Monday again. Uh, yet again. We, we, we were just here a few minutes ago That's what with Steve. Like. It does seem that way. Yeah. So uh, thank yeah. you, everybody, for joining us for yet another Monday night. I see we already have a few folks on, Gary and Matt and Steve hey guys. Uh, here. Uh, glad you could join us. Um, and uh, a, a couple things before we get started. You all know what I'm gonna say if you've been here before. Um, if you haven't subscribed to our page, if you're new to this show and you haven't subscribed, we'd really love it if you'd subscribe to our YouTube page. Right under Dave, actually, is the you subscribe button on the YouTube channel. And on Facebook, there's a little bell on the screen. If you click that bell, you'll subscribe on Facebook. Why should you subscribe? Well, you'll get a notification every time we go live, which would be almost every Monday, and then some random time from some ocean or mountain or ski area, or who knows where we might go live next, and when we do, you'll get notified of that as well. And, uh, and if you are joining us for the first time, we'd love it if you'd let us know you're here. Make a comment in the comment section, say hello. Uh, if you have a beverage with you, let us know what you're drinking. And, uh, and if you enjoy the broadcast today, share it with your friends. And uh, if you think they might enjoy this kind of content as well, and please like and share our, our, uh, our broadcasts uh, as often as you can. We really appreciate it. And uh, I, think, uh, I think I've covered all the bases. So, and look at that, he hasn't said a word. That's amazing. So, uh, so today, we are so excited to oh, have yeah. Dave Kabrensky here. Uh, he's actually not here for the first time. He's been here a few times. Uh, he's, he, uh, he and his, uh, his bandmates have played on this stage right where we're at uh, at least twice now. I think it's two times. Sure. Yeah. And, Sounds right. Uh, yeah. And, uh, and Dave has also been very active in an organization we call The Sounding Board, which is a group of people that we've pulled together to help us figure out how do we make this music venue of ours really, really fly. And uh, so Dave's committed lots of time to that, and we really appreciate it. And, uh, and I've also, I've known Dave since long before really any of this uh, music venue stuff. I used to come see your shows seven when you were seven. doing Seven Odd Seven. Oh, sure. That's yeah, where yeah. I first yeah. met you with right? John Lorenz, and you were at the, uh, the Covered, Bridge. Covered Bridges. Yeah. Sure, and the whole crew. That yeah. was probably eight yeah. years ago or so when you started that. That was sure. incredible. Yeah. Fantastic. So, so uh, that's where I first met Dave. And any time I heard that that uh, Seven Odd Seven was playing at, at that place, I would I would try and find my way there. Cause Very fun exploratory music. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. Every every night was an adventure with that group of seven musicians on stage uh, with with no. No actual written songs, uh, just uh, uh, yeah. an adventurous spirit and a, a bunch of very fine musicians. Yeah. And, <laughs> and, you brought, and you brought something like that here, too, with the performances here. I see you, you guys are up here on the stage, you've all got your instruments, and you're all sort of just playing on your own, and then somehow one of you is excited by what someone else is doing with that melody or those tones and yeah. so you all start looking at each other like okay i guess we're going to be talking about this now with our instruments yeah right? it's this this is music format that that uh we've really come to enjoy and when uh when jed wilson and tim gilmore and i have, have played here we've used that format where uh jed of course is a is a brilliant uh, pianist and, yeah, and tim's uh, such an accomplished uh, jazz drummer and uh in me I, I play my my all my stuff that i learned in west africa uh, but we have no songs 
um, and somebody starts with an idea and we, we write the song on the spot so that it's, uh, it's as, as fresh for us as it is for it's the audience so every time fantastic. it happens. Yeah, and it's, it. and uh, on the, uh, it's great because it's, uh, it, it's kind of a scary way to perform on stage as a musician, just to know that there's, there's nothing to fall back on, there's nothing that you can rehearse. But on the, by the same token, there's nothing to rehearse. There's just like, it's the format is like, everybody just has to know their instrument so well and trust their ears and be as good of a listener uh, as a player uh, to, to pull it off. And we have a blast with it. I, I learned so much, because uh, this is a, a genre I'd never even participated in or heard of before, seeing you guys in Seven Odd Seven. And I remember coming and, and getting my head around this concept yeah. and then trying to follow. <laughs> you know, pay attention to certain, I'd watch your eye contact across um, the stage yeah, yeah. and see who was sort of leading into the next chapter of whatever it is you were going to be playing right, and, right. and watching others sort of come in behind. And, and there were times when I felt like you, you really hit your mark oh. and then there were other times and I felt like you were kind of trying to find it <laughs> and looking for it sure. together yes. and, and then finally yes, somebody uh, would go. It's just, it was yeah. such a learning experience to see how how you interacted on stage mm -hmm. with each other and, yeah. and made music like that. It's an adventure and it's a learning experience for us every time. And I think it's fun for the audience because um, they're along for, for the ride. There's a little bit of sometimes of a tension, as you said, as we're, as we're, we're finding the way to this thing, you know, and uh, if we have a good night, we, we, we find it and we get to some pretty interesting it's, places. Yeah. <laughs> and and, and, yeah, and uh, we were talking about shameless plugs. This is a great opportunity. Uh, and actually, Randy and Michelle are here watching oh, today. Hey, so, Randy, uh, hey, Randy. Hey, Michelle. Randy, Michelle. Um, uh, uh, Randy Roos is going to be performing with you and uh, uh, who are the, who's, the, do you, the names of all the folks who are going to be on stage. With uh, I believe uh, Steve Hunt Steve will be Hunt, on yep. on piano. Yep. And uh, Mike Rossi on Mike bass. Mike Rossi on bass. And I'm pretty sure we have Tim on Tim drums. On drums. And Tim is, is that, on drums. Is that yes, right? That right? is okay. correct. Yes. Yeah. Yes. You're, you're yeah. Right. I'm so bad with names. I just wish I could get so better. Be a group yeah. Of I'm bad with names too, Fred. Yeah. <laughs> yeah thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Understood. So um, the the uh, I mention it because that is a little bit about what you guys are going to be doing yeah. on the 28th. It's December 28th. Uh, um, sure, yeah, and uh, so uh, the group uh, Hall of Mirrors, uh, I, I'm going to be um, sort of a, a guest artist on that one, uh, but uh, Randy and, uh, and that gang uh, has produced a couple of albums now under the name of Hall of Mirrors. Yep. It is just this really beautiful, exploratory, um, jazz, uh, experimental vibe that is just really just beautiful to listen to and um, just absolutely amazing music, and so so I, I'm, you know, Randy. Uh, I, sh I shouldn't speak for you, but I mean, obviously, Randy is su such a, a wonderful musician, and uh, and they've kind of embraced this this genre, even in the studio, of just like improvising a song right. and recording it and, and seeing what comes of it. And um, so I think that they'll be playing some songs, but but I think it just goes where it goes. And um, I'm happy to be along for the ride and uh, with such an, an amazing group of musicians. That is how he's talked about that that show. He's yeah. gonna he's gonna sort of let it. Yeah. Let it ride and, uh, yeah. and sort of follow the follow the night. Yes, and that's here on December twenty eighth. Is that right? I think it's twenty eighth. It's Thursday night. Thursday night. Okay. Yep. If how, you're in the area, often, I wouldn't miss you, it. Yeah. How often are you playing out where people can come and and hear you? Um, how, well, is that do you have a set schedule for the next few months? Um, do you have not a set schedule. Uh, I, I go for periods where where I'm busy. I I try to group uh, concerts so I can get on the road and. Um, and kind of hit a bunch of uh, towns, uh -huh. and uh, so I just kind of finished a um, sort of a northeast mini tour, if you will, okay. where I went as far uh, as uh, as Syracuse, New York, and uh, did parts of upstate Cafe New Lena? York. And uh, no, not this time around. Mm -hmm. But uh, you played there before? A uh, long time ago. Long time ago. That place has been around for a long time. Yeah, sixty years, I think. Yeah, I'm not that old. So, um, <laughs> but but I played there when I was young. I, pr I played there when I was in in, in my twenties. So that, that was a while ago. I won't tell you how long ago. <laughs> <laughs> I got to go there for the first time. So when right. you said New York, I figured. I haven't been there in a while. Um, but I perform with a couple of different uh, groups these days. One of the things that I'm doing recently, which is a lot of fun, is actually just a solo thing where um, I combine um, uh, some, some music that I, I have learned uh, over the years of, of traveling and studying and living in West Africa. And um, I, I perform on some of these instruments, the, the 
Fula flute, what they refer to as the Tambi Fule in Guinea, uh, as well as the, the Kama Lingoni. I don't know if you can see this off stage, um, and so, uh, some other instruments, but I also weave it into this evening of, of storytelling. And uh, it's a lot of fun, um, and it becomes, there's also a lot of improvising in terms of both the music and the stories that come out of it, but it's a, really a fun format. Um, and then uh, a, new, a new old project for those out there who, uh, who have known me a while uh, will remember uh, the group Landaya uh, with uh, Sion Kamara, who is uh, an amazing master drummer from Guinea, West Africa. And so we have a group called Sion Kamara and Landaya. And that used to be um, a six or a seven person group, but these days we're a trio uh, along with m myself and Grant Ellerbeck on uh, the Dunun drums. And it's, boy, it's really been a lot of fun, uh, just the, the three of us to make this uh, beautiful traditional West African music with uh, Sion Kamara, who is just uh, just such a showman. And um, can we get this that? new group? Oh, we can get it here. I, I want you to know that I, I'm in conversations <laughs> with, thinking, right? with, so with John, the, your, the guy who books your shows yeah. for you. Yeah. We've been talking John about Lorenz. it. And uh, Sion at the moment is in uh, West Africa until, until April. So we're going to miss okay. the, uh, the, the, the winter, winter series, but hopefully we can get but that trio. Get it in the summer or fall. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, yeah. that would be great. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so we've been doing a bit more of that. It's a bit of a revival because we stopped performing probably for about six years or so right. um, during the pandemic, obviously. But uh, we've recently picked it back up, and we we're just having an absolute blast with it. <laughs> so that that gets me to a point. I, I, I want to step back a little bit. We jump mm -hmm. right in on all kinds of stuff that's going <laughs> on, current stuff, which is you know, I knew this was going to happen, and we we're going to we're going to have a lot to talk about. Yeah. But. Uh, most of the people out there are meeting you for the first time. So mm -hmm. I wanted to have an opportunity to learn a little bit about who you are, where you, oh, sure. where you come from, and how you got to this place you are. Because I find that story fascinating. And another shameless plug, the book that you see sitting, it's, it's, it's right on the camera, so you don't even yes. need to pick it up. This one. Front I know I wanted to hold it. You want to hold it? <laughs> I held it for a while. So uh, mm -hmm. Finding the Source, uh, I, I learned of this book at one of your performances here. I picked it up right away. and it. it it really was a page turner for me. Oh, yeah, it's a great book. I absolutely enjoyed it. Everybody turned on, turned Ken onto it, and and I think at least four or five other people in my life have read it. So we've been passing it around. It's, Chuck's it's, read it. I'm picking up another copy. Geraldine's read it. My, uh, Chris yeah. is is reading it. Yep. Uh, he's our sound engineer. Anyway, great book, and it tells a great story, um, really dynamic story of about 20 years of your life, and really well told fascinating, really interesting uh, places that you've gotten a chance to visit and characters that you've met along the way. And we don't have the hours necessary to obviously cover so many of the great stories in that, but, but uh, in a snapshot, you know, mm -hmm. tell us about a little bit of that background and how you, how you ended up writing that book. Sure. Um, well, my, I feel like my, uh, my life took an interesting turn uh, in the early 2000s when uh, I had the opportunity to traveled to West Africa for the first time. Um, that, in alo that alone, how that came to be is its own story, of course, which is in the book. It's um, a great story. But, um, but it really changed, uh, changed my life for a number of reasons. One, as a musician, um, uh, after, you know, during the course, I should say, of, of 20 years of, of traveling and living in uh, uh, this small village in West Africa and going back almost every year for, uh, for, uh, for a decade or so, um, changed me both as a musician but also as as a person because you can't you can't live in another culture who thinks uh, and lives as differently as they do without having your own worldview uh, be affected in some ways and there was a, a, a big period of my life where I was really living in between two worlds um, uh, the world of, of West African indigenous thought and culture and uh, modern uh, Western American society, and it was uh, it was a it was a hard fit. Um, but there's there's a, an interesting thing that happens when you are uh, kind of living in this in between place. Uh, you can kind of call it the edge uh, of being. You're not in one world. You're not in the other. Where it's is a there's this dynamic that forces you to to really rethink a lot of things and and um, find a, a way creatively to to reckon with those two different worldviews. And so both in terms of my life and thinking as a musician, but also as a, as a human being living on this planet, mm -hmm. kind of coming to question 
our place in the world and how we view it and how that affects uh, the way that we live on earth. Uh, and also just uh, from a very personal point of view of, uh, of dealing with uh, my own health challenges, which uh, people who read the book will know that I had my fair share of uh, during the course of this time and uh, the way that I see, see healing, um, and um, both in terms of a physical and mental and emotional and even spiritual way. So that's in a nutshell, maybe did I, did really I, did well I kind done. of capture yeah, no, finding I, the source. Yeah, but. that's really. I, I love <laughs> the way you talk about the two, the, the massive differences between the indigenous West African living closer to natural systems and the modern, high-paced Western world with the big pharma's throwing out various drugs, especially dealing with health issues, mm -hmm. and other people worrying about what the ancients are doing to control your health. And that's like, what do you mean? The ancients are affecting my health? That's, that doesn't make any sense to me in my paradigm growing up in New England or whatever it is. Sure. And you capture it beautifully. And that's, I, I love paradigms and, and different perspectives. And that's something that I do personally in my life. That's what we talk about all the time. So this is just, you know, a, a great story along those lines. And it, and it can be put then to anybody in any position in their lives as a way to step back and think about, okay, where am I, what am I doing, and why do I do what I do? Mm -hmm. And you start to recognize all of the forces around you that shape you, mm -hmm. not you shaping you, all these outside forces packing you into this little clay thing that moves about. <laughs> sure, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. So uh, there was one moment, and there were, there were so many stories that really struck me, but there was one particular story I'll, I'll share, and I, I won't give the whole story away, well maybe I will, but <laughs> it was, it was a, a real aha moment when you took out, there were a group of people that you uh, had done so much for you, and you took them out to dinner at this. Oh. Yes, I like this, that. Segment. This city, yeah. inner city or, or uh, uh, downtown yeah. restaurant, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which which in that part of the world, economically, to you, was was pretty affordable. Yeah. But to the group of people that you were spending time with, and you can correct me if I'm not framing this correctly, but um, was way, way out of their, you know, a, a dinner there was yeah. the cost of an income for a month or something like sure. this. And so you took this group of people there. Tell, tell us that story. Yeah, great. sure. Uh, so, uh, you know, when I was living in West Africa, we spent um, part of our time in the capital city, Conakry, which is, um, um, you know, a very, uh, a very interesting and, and, frankly, kind of a wild place to spend any time because, um, I mean, the poverty is, is pretty intense, but it's this, uh, this peninsula city, um, not very large um, area-wise, uh, that is home to about 11 million people. <laughs> And there's about a um, you know uh, anywhere somewhere in the ballpark of a 95% unemployment rate, uh, which just means that that um, there is no work for people in the city. Um, people leave their traditional villages and their their traditional way of life in, in this very rural part of the country to come to Conakry uh, to to find a job to make some money because um, until very recently and, and even in a, in a to a great extent today, uh, money isn't used in the villages. Um, because there, there, there is no money there, and it's, it's not the, the, the way that commerce works Trade. in a traditional yeah. African village. Um, but people do come to Conakry in search of work to make actual money in, in hopes that they can uh, better their lives. And of course, they have this, this promise of, of the Western way of living sort of being dangled in front of them that is, um, is just not attainable for, for most people there, no matter how hard they work. And so um, when we're in Conakry, and you know, we don't spend a whole lot of time in Conakry because it really is um, it's a very congested, uh, difficult place to be, in my opinion. I love going to the villages where we, where we travel, sometimes 20 hours by car to, uh, to get to some of my friends' village, uh, villages uh, along the Niger River, where you cross the, the, the Niger River in a, in a dugout canoe and you leave your, your car on the far bank of the Niger River. And, and you're in this place that has no, no cars and no electricity. And for me, it was like stepping back in time. Yeah. But a lot of my friends that I spend time with in Konakri, the city, come from that village. And uh, most of them don't have any work or they, they uh, subsist uh, on very, very little. And uh, so while we were there, um, um, myself and a group of friends thought it would be a great idea to take everybody out to, uh, to, a, um, 
to a restaurant in Conakry, and it was a, a French restaurant called uh, Le Damier. And it was uh, just this re really um, nice, it was a nice restaurant for, for Conakry, and the, the food was really uh, quite good, and I thought it would be a treat. I, I really, we all thought it would be a good idea. And so, so we ordered up all this food, and we helped people order the food, because a lot of the people that we were with uh, didn't, uh, didn't read or write, so they needed help ordering. And, um, and uh, we had a grand time. And uh, on our way out of the, the restaurant, um, we, they gave us the bill and we go down to the register and uh, we were hoping that we could kind of keep it discreet uh, as we, we paid for it. Uh, because w while a lot of my friends there maybe didn't, didn't read or write, they knew numbers, uh, they, they knew money. And um, of course, to our, to our misfortune, I suppose, the, the, the total came up on this big digital screen oh, no. uh, at the cash register and that was, um, I'm, I'm going to forget the money be, uh, be, the, or the conversion because it's about 7,000 guinea francs to the dollar. And we went out with about uh, 10 people. I recall like 60 or $80 or something. Yeah. I don't remember. It, it maybe ended up being about 15 or $20 a head. Not bad at all for, for, uh, for dinner In out. terms. Right? Yeah. But it came to like, you know, several million guinea francs. I, mean, I don't even remember what the conversion was. It, it may be like 56 million guinea francs. I, I don't even know. Um, but they saw the number and they were absolutely mortified. They had no idea, and we and it was the the ride home and the taxi was silent and it was just sort of like, wow, what's going on? We thought this would be a jovial yeah. situation, and and my friends from the village said, David, you must never tell anybody that we came here with you. The money that we spent uh, on that one meal for us is enough to feed our entire village for a month, and it was really kind of a sobering moment. Uh, you know, very sobering. What we had thought was this uh, this nice gesture, really brought to light uh, the, the different worlds. The different worlds. The discrepancy between what we have, and what other people have, and the things that we take for granted here in the West. So I've always uh, thought very differently about things, just even since that that moment. Yeah. Well, and speaking of another another part of the story that really was fascinating to me, I, I, when I dig into a, a book that's that's real, that's, that's not a novel, that's a, a, a story about a real activity. I always find myself, I, I'll have my phone next to it, I'll Google you know, names and, and places and I wanna know, you know, you reference a town, I wanna see what that looks <laughs> like and get pictures and so the whole way as you're venturing into the, you know, hundreds of miles into, the, into Africa, into parts of Africa that, that most people will never see in a lifetime, and, and I was zeroing in on trying to get pictures of the huts you were talking about <laughs> and the river, and I found one of the bridges. I, I found a picture of a bridge you, you referred to, and I wanted Amazing. to see the images that sure. followed the story, right. and uh, it was fascinating. I really enjoyed that. Uh, That's good. That's good. Finding myself there a little bit. That's cool. That's cool. Yeah, so there's, there's a lot of adventures for people who are uh, interested in the book, perhaps. There's a lot of adventures. There's, uh, there's, uh, Sorcerers, there's mu uh, musicians, there's uh, all kinds of uh, crazy things that uh, that happen, and so. I so you went there as uh, I think you you found your way there initially as an illustrator, if I remember correctly, and somehow uh, that morphed into your your interest in African drumming, and that morphed into relationships with with people who were some of the most important African drummers in that part of the world. Yeah. And, and that's how you brought that into your music. And that? you kept doing yeah. both, the illustrations and the, and the music. And yeah. Yeah, well, my first, uh, my first sort of experience with, uh, with African, West African culture in, uh, in particular was in college. Yeah, when yeah. I, when I was, yeah, yeah, I was working, uh, yeah. I had an internship working for the anthropology department. And, yeah. and um, uh, so I've, I've kind of maintained that, that um, that kind of uh, combination of uh, of art and music and culture and stories and pretty much everything that I do. So, yeah, so I think we should do another great. shameless plug. <laughs> you have a couple other books here. That oh, sure, are yeah. Available. You talk about those. Oh, sure, yeah. Um, Tell us about this one. Sure, Joliba Crossing is uh, was my first book. Is my first book. Uh, um, came out in 2013. It's in its second edition now. Um, uh, Joliba is the uh, the word that the, the locals use for the Niger River. Um, so to them, it's not the Niger; it's the Joliba. And um, I will never forget the first time that I that I crossed the 
the River Joliba, and uh, it was like entering into a new world, like I've said. And so this book was uh, uh, my sort of uh, illustrated musical adventure travelogue, I suppose, uh, that has led into other things. And, and uh, what do you have here? Okay, Drawing on Culture, uh, my second book. Um, there was one year that I was in the village for an extended stay, and I decided to, as I always did, I had art supplies with me, but I decided to bring some, uh, some, uh, some nicer paper and uh, just a set of pencils, and I set about for the four or so months that I was there living in this, this little village to, uh, to draw portraits of, uh, of pretty much everybody that would, that would let me and collect their stories as well into kind of like what I consider to be um, an illustrated ethnography. It's basically um, stories of who these people are. I felt like I had already told you know, my story in Julia Crossing and in Finding the Source later too, but I wanted to tell their story. Who are these people that I was living with and uh, who had influenced me so much? And so it's a book of my drawings and, and their stories. So. And if you want to learn more about some of the details of these books and other things that that uh, Dave's been involved in. He has All a website, website David, right. davidkabrensky.com. Yeah, that's is right. There he is. Yep. And uh, there's quite a wealth of information about all of this. So uh, I, we have only an hour, which is, as we said, going to go by in, <laughs> in moments. <laughs> and uh, I think if, if, if you would, to share some of the music. That's, oh, sure. that's where I was yeah, going. I, I, you brought a couple instruments, and I want to yeah. make sure people have an opportunity yeah, to share. Some of the people out there play. may not have heard you. Which okay, is, yeah, which is, sure. And you need to come here and live, but, but this is the next best thing. Sure, maybe we'll start with, uh, with uh, this instrument here. Can you here. tell a little story about how you went and learned how to play this, and sure. then you came back, and that isn't necessarily made out of a West African reed, if I remember your, <laughs> right. your, your some, oh, some hey, bamboo let piece me, or something. If I can step off camera so for a moment, I think I have <laughs> one of the original <laughs> wooden ones. Yes. Let's see if I can put this down. No, so I've never seen you play that on stage. The, the it's true. Yeah. I, I don't bring these on the road often uh, anymore um, because this, this right here is uh, what, what I mentioned earlier called the Tambi Fule in the Malinke language, uh, more commonly known as the Fula flute or the, the Fulani flute. Um, it originates with the Fulani people who are a, 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 a very ancient nomadic uh, tribe of people who live all throughout West Africa. Um, but it's also like the shared instrument, the Malinke people sort of claim this instrument as, as their, one of their own traditional instruments too, the Tambi Fule. And uh, I was in um, West Africa initially because I was interested in uh, and the percussion, uh, for instance, the, the djembe and the dunun drums. And my first teacher uh, there, a man named Famadou Konate, became a mentor uh, to me, and I'm still friends with him to this day. He's 86. And, um, uh, but while I was there, I met uh, this man uh, named Lansani Konde, who was a master of the, the tambi fule. And he and I became um, uh, really close friends uh, over the years, uh, like brothers. And uh, I would, became his apprentice, um, learning how to uh, both play and make this flute. And the flute is made out of this, uh, this reed called tambi. I get, get this name, tambi fule, literally m means flute made out of the tambi wood. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a really amazing three-hole uh, flute um, that uh, is just, I, first time I ever heard it, it was just, to me it was like hearing like the voice of Africa, you know? Yeah. It just had this sound. I'll play a little bit of this traditional yeah. flute. And um, I kind of fell in love with this instrument. And um, so over the years, working with Lansini, I learned a great a portion of his, uh, of his repertoire. Uh, we studied together uh, every year for 10 years, and then we uh, were, were constant friends after that, and uh, learned how to make these instruments, too. And uh, the wood itself is very fragile, um, and it doesn't really like the climate of New England, uh, because uh, the dry and the cold, it tends to crack, which is why I don't bring these on the road. Uh, but I used to play these, the wooden flutes extensively, but Lansani encouraged me to, um, once I had with him mastered how, how to make the flutes with him out of wood, he encouraged me to find other materials that I could source here in the United States. Um, 
And so over the course of, of, of a decade, I experimented with making um, the same exact kind of flute, um, but out of uh, locally sourced uh, materials uh, that were more durable. And so this, uh, if you can see here, is, um, is genuine PVC. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it took me about that first where does time. that grow? First time you yeah, told it, us it, that it grows Depot, in, the, right? in the jungles of New Jersey, I think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but it, you know they don't only make these flutes out of wood there in West Africa. They'll use sometimes uh, metal pipe or, or whatever they have mm -hmm. access to, and it doesn't change the sound whatsoever. And so um, let me actually use this one here. Um, uh, so. The scale that it uses is not quite the Western scale. It's uh, known as a, um, we call it a, uh, an equidistant heptatonic flute. It's a seven note scale, but all the, the notes are equally spaced. Hmm. So there's no whole tones and half tones. It's just basically like three quarter tones the whole way. Um, so, so over the course of many, many years working with Lanzini and coming home like a mad scientist and trying to get the same exact sound and scale out of this flute essentially made out of PVC, um, I finally, after you know a decade of trying, finally got Lanzini's approval. Every year, it was, it was heartbreaking. I'd, I'd go there and show him my, my latest version of the flute, and he'd pick it up, and he'd go, nah, not yet. <laughs> and, and I'd come back the next year. Is this all based on ear? All based on, uh, on ear. Okay. It was just like there was the, the, the sound wasn't quite right, maybe, or the, uh, the tuning wasn't quite right. His ear was very particular. He made his flutes without any um, you know, uh, tuning instruments. He did it all by ear. A flute was right if uh, a song that he knew so well sounded right on it. And he was incredibly accurate with his flutes without any uh, tuning devices to make flutes that consistently uh, were perfectly in tune with each other. And so, so the flutes is here the, sound... Is the, tune, is the tuning the spacing of the holes? Well, and the sure. the length of the pipe? Yeah, yeah, all of those things. Um, and it was actually a little bit tricky to make it out of, um, out of a, a column that does not taper. Yeah, that, uh, one, that one's curved yeah, the, and tapers. The, the great thing about the wood is that, I mean, all flutes suffer from what we refer to as upper register flatness. And a tapered flute uh, handles that problem quite well. Uh, but a non-tapered flute, I had to find ways to, to make it be in tune throughout the whole register. And so, hmm. so these, these flutes sound... Right, right. Pretty sure not. Yeah. <laughs> and so, so that was kind of my, my adventure uh, as a, as a flute making apprentice to a master there. Uh, Lansini and I met. I guess we met. In, well, I guess it was more than a decade. We met in two thousand and three, and um, and uh, you know we we've been friends ever since his his uh, sad untimely passing just about a year and a half ago, um, at the age of fifty two. Oh, um, he, he died too young, uh, as is the case uh, quite frequently in West Africa sure. without um, access to, to medical care and whatnot. So, um, so that was sad, but I, I, every time I, I perform, uh, every time I, I uh, you know, in finding the source in a lot of ways, it was his story as well. Because like I said, we were like brothers over the years. Um, I yeah. mean, it was part of his family, uh, lived with his family uh, for months at a time, uh, year after year. And uh, so every time I do a performance, really, it's, it's in large part a tribute to Lansini. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, am I correct in saying it, for a while you were making and selling those fruits, flutes, maybe you still are, yeah. and he was a business partner in that, and yeah. he received some of the, the income. Oh, yeah, I, he received all of it. And um, uh, we started this company together called uh, the Casa Flute Company. And mm -hmm. at the time when I met Lansini, he and his family, he was the, the, the breadwinner for the family, his extended family of about eight or nine people were living on about $400 a year, uh, we calculated. And um, in, intense poverty, um, living in, uh, you know, in Konakri, they lived in a house that had corrugated uh, tin roofs, yep. and in the rainy season, were constantly getting washed out and flooded. And, um, and you know, when we started working together, I said, you know, there's, I'm sure that I could sell your flutes in America and, and, and get you some money for them. So we started this company called Casa Flute Company. And Casa is the Malinke word for, uh, for granary, but it's also a family of, of rhythms that are related to, uh, to um, farming and the harvest. Huh. 
So we decided that Casa Flute Company was a good name. We, we, we kind of thought it was kind of like the working man's flute company yeah. uh, sort of thing. And so I started taking um, you know, a pile of his flutes, of his wooden flutes, home with me every year and selling them. And I would sell them for, at the beginning, I would sell them for $125 and send 100% of that money back to him. And uh, we did that for a number of years, and it really, really changed uh, his financial situation in Quanacri, and they were able to, to really upgrade their their living situations in, in, um, in a great way. And and, um, and even at that time, as I was getting better making uh, my flutes, and um, I would make my own flutes and sell those too, and give Lansini um, almost the majority of the money for those as well. Uh, just enough, to, I kept enough to cover my costs. Yeah. yeah. Um, because I wasn't doing it for the money. Every time I made a flute, I got better at doing it. But also, there's an interesting thing about the master-apprentice relationship in West Africa. For, for a master of anything in West Africa, having an apprentice is a little bit like having a, um, a retirement plan. Because the way that it works is that the apprentice will continue working and doing whatever it is long after the master is, is able to continue working. But the master will, will continue getting a portion of of the earnings from it. That's sure. just like, I trade you a free education for the guarantee that, yeah. that you'll that's always... That's their retirement plan. That's their retirement plan. So I figured, uh, why should it be any different with me? And so, so right. I, I honored that, and uh, still to this day, uh, even though Lansini has passed, I'm in contact with his family, and um, after he passed, we did a fundraiser, and because um, uh, they were in some, a pretty dire situation without the without their... Their, their papa, and sure. uh, so we did a fundraise and we, we raised money to pay for an entire year's rent for them in Conakry for the, the family. At this point, the extended family of about 18 or 20 people. Wow. Wow. And um, so I just see that as just like just one small thing that I can give back yeah. as a part of this yeah. reciprocity, of cultural reciprocity. It's good. So, yeah. it's a good so, thing so do. an interesting thing, you, you talk about poverty, and in Conakry, I'm not sure I'm saying that right, but in, in this part of the world, uh, poverty is probably pretty apparent in the way in which people live mm -hmm. alongside each other. But then you describe the villages that were three, four, or 500 miles into Central Africa. And although the people living in those villages were probably earning uh, uh, no more or, or probably way less mm -hmm. than anybody living in the big city, um, but would you consider poverty a way to describe their situation? Uh, I, I wouldn't actually, and um, because it's all it's all relative. Um, right. There is uh, this really uh, great uh, book that I read. Um, I'm going to forget the the author's name, but the the book was called Affluence Without Abundance, and the book was about the Khoisan people of um, of the Kalahari Desert, and he um, he studied them. They're the oldest culture on on the on the planet. They have lived in uh, that part of of uh, southern eastern Africa for, um, as far as we can tell, uh, 40,000 plus years um, successfully. And they consider themselves affluent because uh, nature provides for them everything that they need. They have never wanted for anything. I, and I should say there is a sad part of the story and that is their culture came to an end in our lifetime yep. um, after 40,000 years of living successfully in this place. Um, but affluence does not have to mean uh, abundance. Um, uh, we use our, our monetary uh, you know, terms uh, to, to describe whether one is wealthy or not or how much we have. And certainly in a capitalistic system um, where you have to have certain needs met in modern society, um, proper housing and electricity and water and sewerage and all these kinds of things, Kind of a lot of the terms that we use to describe poverty don't apply in a traditional village because somebody who is wealthy in a, a village might just be somebody who has a second cow. Um, yeah. and With lots of apprentices. Absolutely. <laughs> and um, and so, so wealth is a very different thing. Yeah. I mean, wealth uh, for, three, for a lot of three people. Three wives and 14 kids. I, I, mean, yeah. I mean, wealth, a lot of times you just, they describe wealth in terms of their, their community, their, their, their social status within the community. Mm -hmm. um, um, the size of their family is a is a great uh, sign of wealth to them, yep. uh, so it's just very different. Um, but but certainly by us, our standards, we would consider them to be poor because they don't have the things that we have. But I just don't really think it's a it's a, a fair comparison. It isn't. No, that's yeah. why I brought it up. And yeah, it's really. It's, I'm yeah. trying to I'm trying to uh, in my life here in this culture yeah. trying to 
look at money differently. Yeah, yeah. it's the hardest. It's the hardest conflict when you find yourself in a situation mm -hmm. where you're sort of showed, well, you will be happy if you have that. Mm -hmm. You will have made it if you have that, and mm -hmm. that's wrong. It's mm -hmm. just wrong. Mm -hmm. And what hap What makes you happy is the people in your life. Sure. And the experiences yeah. that you have yeah. with those people, yeah. and the places that you get to visit with those people, and and uh, th that's what adds value to my life. Yeah. And right. it's hard, you know. We're culturally raised for my entire life to think that the value comes from the things that I can buy with the money that I earn. That's mm -hmm. the very capitalistic, right. mm -hmm. uh, traditional way to look at sure. it. And certainly, there's there's some value. There, you know, there's some aspects of that in our culture. We 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 live that way mm -hmm. for years, but. Um, it is. It, you see, it is you becoming see it more in apparent the, in yeah. the people too. I, for my geology work, I've had times to be out in the, out in the middle of nowhere in Uganda and Rwanda, Central African areas, and every time we come to an area, we're looking at rocks and the geology and the terrain. They're just these little kids and huts and people, and they're smiling and they're running around, and it's it's a sort of a joyous place. Mm -hmm. And yet they, you know, have a few rags on and mm -hmm. T-shirts with their slogans from Western worlds and different mm -hmm. things that are all mm -hmm. tattered, bare feet and running around, and and or they're carrying a hoe and they're going out to mm -hmm. work on the cassava or whatever it is. But it's a happy place mm -hmm. in so many ways. Yeah. And and you and you realize and when you go into the urban centers, which are trying to mimic the rest, you see everybody on their cell phones mm -hmm. and. Mm -hmm and all of the capitalist sort of things coming in from the outside. Mm -hmm. And it's, that's the sad part. That's the, the sure. it's inevitable, it's change. It's just mm -hmm. dynamic, just yeah. like anything else in the biosphere. Humans are just one of those dynamic actors on that stage. Sure, and yeah, and, and change is really, as change. the cliche, yeah. is, the, is the only constant. But, the only <laughs> but change has always been a factor of, of every culture. And yeah. even, even in West Africa, my teachers like Famadou Konate, have said that this culture has always been changing and evolving. Right. And, and I, I like to just clarify for people too that just because people live in a simple way doesn't mean that they're simple people. Mm -mm. Because, right. because what I discovered right. in, uh, with Lansani and Famadou and uh, in the villages that I lived in is that this was a very, very complex society with complex belief systems and mm -hmm. very, very uh, evolved ways of, of understanding their, 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 their place in space, if, to borrow the term from Gary Snyder, how well they know their, their land, um, the, the rivers, the lakes, the plants, the trees, yeah. everything, and the way that they feel like they fit into it. And I have to say that I think it's just really, it, 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 in some ways, it's it maybe even more evolved, their, their yeah, understanding of, of, of how to live in a place without, without destroying it, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Something that we haven't figured out yet, even with all of our technology. No, in fact, <laughs> in fact we, we're moving away from it as fast as we possibly can. Right. Yeah. We're, we're pushing ourselves farther and farther away from it. Mm -hmm. It's like early settlers coming into this, onto this continent in the 1500s and 1600s and finding people running around and living in their way and thinking, oh no, we, we've got these European standards and our Christian gods and our mm -hmm. monetary system. You guys are savages. Mm -hmm. it's, that's idiotic. It's completely So th this reminds me of another tidbit that I picked up from your book that really uh, struck me, and that was that you were brought to uh, to be part of a school, a drumming school, to demonstrate to the youth of that community that somebody in this culture, which was a culture that the youth were really aspiring to be, right. uh, were uh, this teacher wanted them to see that somebody in your culture. Yeah. Really a Western white guy there, bringing it right. back, bringing it back yeah. to them yeah. for their kids to not go the Western route. <laughs> uh, sure. Well, I have I have this old friend, and it was um, uh, my very very first trip to West Africa in 2001 uh, was to Ghana, and I went there to go see a man named uh, Ni Tete Tete, um, who lived uh, outside of Accra in Ghana. Accra is the capital city. He lived in a little village called uh, Nungwa. Uh, it was a coastal village, and uh, he had this idea for starting a cultural center uh, in, his, in his village um, because he was afraid that the young people were no longer interested in their own culture. Yeah. And that if, if, uh, if it even went for one generation where, the, culture doesn't, where the, the, the generation doesn't understand their culture, it's gone. Yeah. And he understood that. And, um, and, and like you said, uh, the kids there, um, 
uh, had access to to television and uh, billboards that they saw and advertisements where where Coca-Cola. they Coca Cola yeah Coca Cola <laughs> and, and and they they wanted to be like Europeans they wanted to be like um, Americans and um, so he had this brilliant idea of one not only having a, a cultural center where people from his own culture could could study uh, the music the singing the dance but that part of the year he would bring uh, Westerners there. Uh, with the dual aim of one, raising money for the cultural center, but two, showing the young people there that people from Europe, America, Australia, from Want Japan, to know wherever, what they have. are interested in their culture. And it was really brilliant and it worked yeah. because it really involved the local community and it made people there, uh, especially the young generation, see that what they have there is special and that we want to understand that we come from afar to understand it. Mm. I think the same thing is true with, uh, uh, with uh, the work that I've done in, in Guinea um, and the, the power of the djembe, one of the most you know, famous uh, percussion instruments in the world maybe today, I don't know, um, where the, the djembe has, has created um, jobs for so many musicians in, uh, from West Africa because there's such an interest worldwide in the music that is, is played with the djembe. And um, it's through that that a lot of musicians in places like, like Guinea and West Africa um, have been able to, uh, to have an income at the same time uh, that they promote their culture their to culture. the world. Right. Yeah. Perfect. Well, yeah, we, we're, we're creeping up on the end of the hour, and you have this <laughs> other really beautiful <laughs> instrument oh, sitting sure. there next to you. And I would <laughs> oh, yeah, to this is great. Tell us about that. And, sure. Uh, and, and, uh, yeah, one of, the inst one of the instruments that I, um, I studied while I was there and, uh, and you know, learned here was called the um, Kamalingoni. And the, the Ngoni family of instruments includes uh, many different uh, stringed instruments. This is just one of them. Um, the original Ngoni uh, is, was the Jelly Ngoni, which is the, the, the Ngoni that the griots play, and it's actually the, the ancestor of the modern banjo. You hear that, Steve? <laughs> Did you know that, Steve? Sobolski? Yeah. Of the banjo. Yeah. Um, yeah, and so when, the, um, when um, slaves from West Africa came to the New World and hmm. uh, were brought here, they tried to recreate their traditional instruments. Uh, with materials they could find in the New World, and the banjo was born, and uh, blues music was born, and then R and B and rock and roll was born. That all goes back to the African influence. Af African all goes back source. to the African instrument, and there's other instruments that that also had a, a hand in inspiring uh, the banjo, but they were all African instruments, West African instruments, North African instruments as well. And um, a interesting thing is that during the 50s and 60s, kids in Bamako, Mali. Uh, we're hearing uh, uh, R&B and blues music uh, coming over the, the airwaves, and they recognized that they could play it on their, their, on their Ngonis. And because th it just came full circle. You know, the music from, from, from the birth of the banjo to blues to rock and roll and R&B and everything came back right, to Mali, right. and, then the, and the kids in Bamako were like, we can play this stuff on our instruments. So uh, just a little piece of this that really fascinates me yeah. is that you know you this all started in a place where really slavery essentially began yeah that's one of the communities that you went to and you visited mm -hmm. one of the places where yeah. many of the slaves who left Africa yeah. came yeah. to this part of the world mm -hmm. and they brought with them culture and they brought with them music and and there was a huge influx of people that came mm -hmm. into our part of the world sure. that brought African culture here mm -hmm. and as you just described that infiltrated its way into our music and into our song and, and stories and all of that. And so it does, it does come full yeah. circle, and that's, that's sure. really how it did. Yeah, I mean, of course, it's, it's you know, one of the most tragic chapters of our, of our history and of the history of West Africa. And uh, we owe so much to, uh, to, to Africa in general, in general and, and West, peoples of West Africa, and that's part of why I do what I do is to try to share uh, my, my stories of, of living with the people there and uh, how beautiful their, their culture is. And, uh, and, and obviously the music was always the, the language, it was the first language that I spoke in common with the people there, with the, uh, the, the djembe and the fula flute and the ngoni here. And so this is kind of a, a modern evolution of the ngoni, uh, which is kind of a cross between the uh, kamalangoni, which means literally young person's harp, and it's a cross between the kamalangoni and the kora, which is the 21-string uh, uh, griot's harp uh, that has existed for, for centuries. And so. Um, it's a really beautiful instrument. Hopefully it stayed in tune during the car ride here.
did you build this? No, I, I did not. Um, this uh, particular Ngoni actually came from Burkina Faso, ah. uh, one of the West ah. African countries where uh, the Ngoni and the Kora yeah. are found yeah. as well. He's a really talented uh, instrument maker yeah. there. Beautiful. You can see just how beautiful this instrument is. And that's actually um, a gourd. It's actually a gourd, yeah, this big calabash with a, um, uh, a goat skin. Uh, this might actually be a calf skin stretched on top of it. Okay. And, um, yeah, and you can see there's, there's a bridge. The bridge is just held up here by the skin and the tension of the strings. Yes, right. And um, there's these two hand pieces here that you hold onto it with and, uh, and play with your thumb and your forefinger. Yeah. And um, they used to use um, a gut string, mm -hmm. and it was sort of lashed, wound around the, the neck. Uh, usually wooden pegs, wooden, I assume, instead of... Uh, not even pegs, it was just the, the, the gut string was lashed around there and you could just move the whole ring of string oh, up really? to tune it. And it was very hard to, to and make ended, it tighten. ended up with a lot of blisters on your thumbs yeah. doing it. And, uh, but that was the traditional way and sometime in the last couple of decades they, uh, they realized they could use high tension fishing line. Yep. Right? So this is, all, this is fishing line. 50 pound test. Uh, about a hundred and ten pounds. Oh, right. on the load. Yeah. You can catch a heck of a fish with that. Yeah. <laughs> if you're, if you're, I guess if you're ever in a pinch and you have one of these. In, so when you, uh, the ocean, when you have to restring it, you got to go to the fishing store. Yeah. Yeah. I, I uh, you know, I, I support Captain Harry's in, in, in Florida. That's where I get my, my fishing line. High pound. You can't really get high test. 110 pound uh, test uh, here in New England, unless you're a deep sea I, I, fisherman. I said 50 pound test because I was looking for Perhaps some like fishing really. line to hold up our Christmas tree one year <laughs> outside, yeah. and it was yeah. a 20 foot tree, and I needed some really yeah. powerful, clear. Yeah. 50 yeah. pound was the best thing. Sure, do. right. Yeah. 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 yeah it's we a hard quadruple to try to make it. Yeah. I don't know what I would do if I caught a 150 pound fish. Man, <laughs> I'd fall in. It'd take you for, yeah. for a swim. for a swim. Exactly. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> Hopefully there'd be a oh, professional yeah. around. <laughs> that worked out well, didn't it? Come on with me. <laughs> so um, uh, 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 another plug again. Somebody asked on the show uh, uh, if you'll be playing here again. We did talk about it, but we'll talk about it again. Mm -hmm. You will be here with Randy Roos and the Hall of Mirrors yep. on December 28th. On Thursday, December 28th. Yes. Yeah. There are tickets available if you're if you're interested in joining for Don't that show. Don't miss it if you're anywhere around. It's worth, it's worth the travel. It's going to be a beautiful it's show for show. sure. And um, and you'll be back. We will see to it with this new configuration, which uh, uh, yeah, sure. I'm excited about. The new really old cool. configuration. Yeah. yeah. Cyan yeah. Kamara well, and new Landa. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. It's a uh, really fun trio. It, it can uh, uh, expose people to the traditional music of West yeah. Africa, which is no it, piano. No, uh, no piano that night. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's all right. We can keep it up there. It's beautiful. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's nice to look at. Yeah. We'll take the cover off. To yeah. See there we go. So, um, and uh, another plug, which we're very in the early stages of talking about, but yeah. uh, you and Randy have started talking about putting on um, a unique performance on a Friday evening, possibly becoming a regular fixture here yeah. on Friday yeah. Friday nights once a month. Once a month. Yeah. Um, not necessarily the, the same as Seven Out Seven, but in that vein, I'm assuming we're talking about, or, or maybe not. Yeah, I think so. I mean, um, we we will draw from jazz and world music and uh, some things in between, probably, and um, and uh, group of musicians. Uh, I guess we don't exactly know who we'll have on it yet. We know yeah. it'll be me and Randy and right. some other people. Well, it's still four yeah. months away, so yeah. you have some time. <laughs> yeah, it, it might be a, a, a you know a rotating cast of characters if we end up doing it you know, once a that, month. That would so. be yeah. kind of cool too. Yeah, right. I mean, yeah. it's so many, always good. There's so many so, great musicians in this area, and yeah. we've, we've been uh, playing with a lot of them for many years now. Oh, yeah. so. That's the thing that was most striking to me when I'd come to the to the covered bridges. I mean, you would have you had a percussion. You had the the djembe mm -hmm. drum yeah. and a couple of those yes. uh, guitar like I, I don't know the language it's okay <laughs> and, uh, and your flutes and you would throughout the night play all three and rotate between mm -hmm. them depending on where the group was going right. and it was that it was, was fun. such a joy and John Lorenz used to switch up too all of a sudden you start rapping and talking stuff and <laughs> he did make the throat different music the throat <laughs> that's thing. right, right. That's the first time I heard oh yes stuff. right just yeah. switch up and everyone's looking yeah, at the, the, like, the tubin okay, style I guess we're throat doing that singing now. It's amazing. Oh, oh my gosh. Deep. Yeah. <laughs> so so and beautiful. Rap. Yeah. 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 It was a I like to throw a little bit of everything into the Three mix. for all, but it's just so 
Awesome. Well, with seven of you up there, seven extremely yeah. talented musicians, yeah. you had two drum sets one time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Bass, piano, yeah. sax. That's right. Yeah, we had Tim and Jared. Jared Steer, yeah. an amazing drummer, and yeah. Tim Gilmore as well. And it was, a, it, was a, it may come back, you know. That's I, fantastic. Yeah, but sure. we're all still playing music together in, in all different configurations yeah. these days. So. Yeah. Now, do you post on your website? How do people find out where where you are and what yep. you're doing in case they want to? Follow you around and yep. listen to everything you've got In case got they miss you on, on the 28th. I, I always have my uh, my schedule of where I'll be uh, with all the different groups and solo stuff on the website. Okay, and right. I encourage people to get on my mailing list. At, uh, you go to davekabransky.com. Right? Um, find it in the link. I don't know. A description. Um, but yeah, sign up on the email list. And I send out, I uh, usually, if I'm not being lazy, I'll send out once a month. Okay. You never have to worry okay. about getting too many emails with me because, you know. Sadly, that's a problem here, too. I know, right? Yeah. <laughs> You're safe to sign up on my newsletter. It's the only way to do it. I mean, you think about the world that we live in in this place. It's total just stuff flashing yeah. at us all the time. Yeah. So you have to be even harder to get someone to know, hey, I'm doing this, remember? I know, I know. It's, yeah. it's We're grateful crazy. for you joining us tonight and giving yes. your attention to this. And, yes. Yeah. Um, because, yeah, like you said, there's a, there's a lot of lot to compete with. There's a lot of noise. And, and Chuck Lawrence would be here. He's a big fan of yours. Oh, Huge wonderful. fan of yours. Right. But he's on flying, flying over he's the 35,000 right feet now. above the Atlantic Ocean right now. Okay. Jet, well, he's got he an excuse now. Oh, well, I guess that's a good reason not to be here. Yeah, that's, yeah. But, uh, we wouldn't want him to be distracted. He, he, he was really looking forward <laughs> to uh, He couldn't zoom in. To being here. He, no, I guess you can't from a pilot's I suppose. position. It sounds unsafe. That would be awkward, yeah. I think. Yes. <laughs> United Airlines might not keep me keen, keen on that. <laughs> um, but uh, we are, before we get to the end, another yeah. shameless self-promotion. You mentioned you've got a couple uh, projects, a couple p possible books. If you yeah, I'd like to hear about uh, these. I, I do, yeah. I do. Oh, okay, well, I, I, I do have a couple of new book projects in the works. But I can't talk about them too much. Okay. Okay. No, I, I don't want to disappoint you. That's okay. It's a, it, just put it out there. It's not that I'm, I'm superstitious or anything. Coming soon. But while they're still in the works, I try not to talk to them, talk about them too much because okay, cool. because it's, the creative energy gets yep. gets diffused. But I do have two new books in the works. I'll I'll just say that. Okay. okay. Well, good. Uh, Sign up on the email list. If you if you read Finding the Source, then you're just going to be waiting with bated breath yeah. for the next chapter. That's right. That's, that's, that's right. right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so do that. Yeah. Don't worry about the new books. Yeah. Read that one. Read that that's one. The, that's <laughs> that's <laughs> yes, exactly. There you and, go. Uh, and is there anything we missed? You, you talked about your books. You talked yeah. about your performances yeah, that coming you up. Tell people your art. Uh, you, you're, you, you, your art's available for oh, yeah. purchase. Yeah. Uh, if, if you go to your website, you can yeah. see some of it. It's beautiful. Yeah, stuff. check out the artwork on the website. Um, uh, lots of artwork there. Of course, the books. You can get the, the books on the website, too. You can also get the books and everything on Amazon and all those places. But, you know. Um, buy them from you. Buy them from me. You know, I don't know. Uh, you check out the books, check out the artwork on the website. Uh, we al also have a couple of CDs, uh, or you know, you can do the, the streaming thing too. But Randy, speaking of Randy, Randy and I put out uh, an EP, five song EP, very recently called Mythos that we're uh, extremely proud of. And, uh, Is that streaming? Uh, it's streaming, and okay. you can also buy the CD either okay. way. You can get find that on Spotify and Apple Music. Look up either Randy Roos or Dave Kabrensky. Either way, you'll find it. It's called Mythos. Um, I have a uh, an album that I did uh, for a project called Afro Flute that is um, all uh, ori mostly original compositions that I play on uh, that I perform on all of the traditional instruments. So you might want to check that out too. Yep. That's also streaming as well. You can, if you're old school and like the CDs, we got those. We That's got what I did when David Burke was here, and, and I was talking about him and his book, and so we pulled that up and listened to that. Oh one right. Night. And we had yeah. my my I've known him since we were little kids, and he's a. Uh, a screenwriter in Los Angeles, so he writes movie stuff. And we had him sitting here talking to people because he had trekked across the country and picked up on it. But I remember <laughs> pulling your music up on that thing. Now, I have a question for yeah. you before we go. Do you have an apprentice now learning from you? Oh, um, because well, this would be sort of, yeah. in, in my outside perspective here, where you becoming a master. Yeah. of this <laughs> right. and, and thinking ahead mm -hmm. over the next couple of decades do you, have you taken on students or yep. more than just the I do typical teach, sort of yeah format? I do I, I have for years um, I have taught um, classes in West African style percussion I'm not currently doing that now except for the occasional workshop um, 
but I probably will get that going again. But I also do teach um, uh, lessons on the Fula Flute. Ah, if you're interested cool. in learning one of these, I can do that either in person or online. Uh, amazing that we can, we can do that. Um, but yeah, if anybody's interested in learning this, I, I think often about, because uh, there are fewer and fewer people in West Africa that know how to make these flutes, um, that Lansani has in, kind of given me this uh, tradition that, that someday I will have to pass on that knowledge right. Uh, right. somehow. I don't exactly know how that will work yeah. to make sure that... Um, yeah, it's that, that same thing, you know, it yeah. becomes the end of the line. You don't want to be that no, end of the line. No, no, Lansani was, I feel really grateful and, and honored that Lansani blessed me with... Um, uh, he didn't have uh, any other students in West Africa, and so uh, about a year before he died, he said uh, he told me he said this is this is your music now. You have to you have to keep it alive. Wow. So that was kind of a, a big no, no, responsibility. No, 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 no way pressure there. there. No, no pressure no, no, there. No pressure. Yeah, but um, I wanted to do it. So Good. that's yeah. great, awesome. And and while we're on shameless self promotion, uh, we hadn't even talked about it, but we've been drinking. Uh, this evening, a very new release of, uh, of Ken's. Uh, so excited to partner with uh, yes. Tamworth Distillery. Yep. We have a, our heirloom crab apple aged in, in their BSOP brandy barrels, three year three year aged brandy barrels. It's it's outstanding. Um, it's available now. In the another bottle empty. Yeah, another <laughs> another one down. So in, and Dave's going to yeah. take one home with him tonight. Yes, uh, that's to, right. Uh, to enjoy, you, you, oh, and you were drinking something else. You had a red wine. Yeah, yeah, delicious. It's got Petit Bleu Reserve. Petit yeah. Bleu Reserve, and yeah. it's low sugar. I found out too. Mm. Zero sugar. Zero. Zero sugar. Zero sugar. See that? Both of right? these are zero sugar. Right. They're Beautiful. Almost, they're almost all zero I sugar. I love it. Here. I love it. So on that note, thank you so much yeah. for coming out. Hey, thanks you guys. This is, this is a pleasure. Yeah. Thank really you guys. Was. Yeah. And I uh, can't wait to see you again on the on the 20th it's just, just a couple weeks yeah, away yeah just a couple weeks and uh, and then we'll we'll hopefully have you have you back for another performance sometime in the fall with your with a, a couple new members of your musician yeah. friends so wonderful thank you all out there for spending another monday night with us and uh, we'll look forward to all seeing you uh, next monday we don't have a show booked for next sunday so we'll we'll uh, we'll surprise you with that hopefully we'll surprise you sooner than monday morning but uh, we'll see what happens you never know <laughs> Thank you again, <laughs> everybody. Have a great night. Uh.